Okay. Um, I'm going to go over a few things today. Um, first thing we're going to talk about is your lab two. For those of you who have not completed it, I'm just going to spend a few minutes sketching it out. Uh, and I hope this is uh, helpful for you. If, if again, you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. So your aim is to put tabs on the page. And I think we all know what tabs are. Tabs are a series of links across the top of the page that sort of look like tabs in, in folders. And when you click on one, then the content area changes to display the tab corresponding to um, the tab that you clicked on. All right, so what do we need to do to make this happen? There's three areas that we need to think about. We need to think about the HTML. We need to think about the CSS. We need to think about the JavaScript. Remember, that's the, that's the triangle, the client-side triangle, um, which uh, affects how things are displayed and how things are changed within the browser. As far as HTML, what do we need? Well, we need our three links. And we need those three sections on the page. So the first step would be to make a page that looks like this. All right. With the three sections, one for JavaScript, one for PHP, and one for Ajax. All right. That's the HTML, and these are the links to the different areas. All right, so that's that. What is the second thing we have to do? Second thing we have to do is the CSS. So what are we gonna do? We're going to hide initially the bottom two. So when our page loads, it's going to look like this. It's going to show the JavaScript tab that's being enabled, the other two tabs, and it's going to show the section for JavaScript. That's how it's going to look when the page initially loads. Now, another thing that we have to do, or maybe not do, is set the CSS such that when JavaScript disappears, PHP or, or when, PH, when you want PHP to appear, JavaScript disappears and PHP slides into the same spot. Um, that actually is easier than it sounds if you set the CSS right. All right. Remember, there's different ways that you can make something invisible. There's a visibility, where, uh, but the visibility takes up space. So if something's not visible, it still takes up the, the space that it would otherwise. What you want is display none, because display none, it acts like it's not even there. And that'll allow the PHP or Ajax to appear in the right slot. Finally, JavaScript. Uh, I, I think I said we want to display the appropriate section and change the color of this. Oh yeah, by the way, in CSS, we can try to make these look like tabs. How can we do that? Well, we can, we can put this right underneath the link. We can put a top and uh, a top and right and left border on the link and no bottom border, at least on the selected one. Those are all different ways that you can, uh, you can accomplish uh, that. All right, JavaScript, what happens when we click something? When we click something, we want to do this. And this is the easiest way to do it. I'm not going to tell you the code, but I'm going to kind of tell you the strategy. What we're going to do is we're going to hide everything as soon as something's clicked. So we click PHP, we hide these three tabs, these three sections, and then we make the PHP one visible. So we hide everything, make the PHP visible. Likewise, when we click Ajax, we're gonna hide everything. We always hide everything first, and then we display Ajax. 
The other thing we're supposed to do is we're supposed to designate this as the whatever the selected link is by changing the color. Well, we're going to then make everything the unselected color and then make our Ajax link or PHP link or JavaScript link the selected color. Now, you could do this by having three functions. JavaScript, uh, when uh, a function that gets called when we click on JavaScript, a function that calls gets called when we click on PHP, a function that gets called when we click on Ajax. However, that's repeated code and repeated code is uh, a no-no. All right, whenever we have repeated code, we should look for opportunities to combine the code into a single function and allow for arguments. So what arguments are we gonna to need to, 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 um, to pass to our function? We're gonna to need to pass the ID of the section we wanna show and the ID of the tab that we just clicked. That should be all the information a function needs to know to hide everything, show the selected section, and then change the link for the selected tab. So you're going to have a function, something like show tab, and it's going to accept an argument for section ID and an argument for tab ID. And that should do it. Now, I'm not going to tell you any more. I know there's more to it than this, but I want you to have some of the fun. I don't want to have all the fun myself. So if you're struggling with this assignment, take a look at that, and I hope it helps. If you still have qu uh, questions, uh, let me know. Now, uh, one of the things I suggest for almost all of the coding assignments that I have, not just in this class, but in every class, is don't try to do everything all at once. All right. Don't try to get your web page perfect the first attempt, first pass. Do it in pieces. So, for example, create the HTML, create the CSS, and then create the JavaScript. With the JavaScript, create that in parts. Change the tab that was selected to the color that you want, or make the other one visible. And then when that works, do the other part. So break it down and do it in sections, as opposed to trying to do everything all in one shot. Do it a little piece at a time. That's such a, bad, a good strategy. Because when you have a lot of code and you're trying to debug, it can sometimes be like the proverbial needle in a haystack. All right? If you get a little piece of it working, then you try to add something and it doesn't work. Well, you know that the problem is probably in that little piece of code that you just added, right? Because it worked up to that point the way that you wanted it. So do it incrementally. Don't try to do everything all at once. All right. We had a leftover uh, question from last time. And that question was, how could I make a button that hid everything, hid all the spoilers? So I posted that example on Canvas. Oh, I'm sorry, not to hide all of them, to show all of them. What if we want to show all spoilers? What can we do? Boom, we click on that and we show them. All right. We could do the same thing with a hide button if we wanted to, but I just did the one for an example. I just had to show all of them. Now, we could do this the brute force way. That is, we could write our function to show spoiler one, show spoiler two, show spoiler three. The problem with that is if I change this to add a spoiler, I would have to remember to show spoiler four show spoiler five, or however many spoilers are added. We want to, besides duplicated code, you know, what, what's the problem with duplicated code? You know, it can sometimes uh, be, um, you know, you, you end up writing more code. 
you end up writing code that is more likely to have bugs, and you write code that makes it harder to maintain. So if we use our heads and write a code, write code to show all of them, regardless of how many that is, then if we add another spoiler, we don't need to change anything in our JavaScript code. So let's look at how we did that. All right, on my on click, I call show all spoilers. That's pretty straightforward. What does show all spoilers do? It gets a list of spoilers using this. All right. In the past example, we used document get element by ID to get one particular element on the web page, right? It's going to be one element on the web page because an ID uniquely identifies something. So if I say, give me something that has an ID of whatever's in this variable, we know that we're only pointing to one thing. This says, use the query selector to select everything that matches this query. Now, this should look familiar. This is what I put in the class, if I want to make all these three spoilers have the same CSS. So each spoiler has a class of spoiler. So what select, I'm sorry, query selector all, and if I put in dot spoiler, it will give me a list of all the things I have a class of spoiler. I could do this and give me everything that is a link on the page. All right, that's what the A would mean because A is a selector in CSS to say every link, right? We want to do every, something to every link, we put A and then we put our spot style rule. If I wanted to do every link within the spoiler section, I could say within a spoiler uh, section, I could say spoiler dot a, and it wouldn't give it would give me the links that are in that which has a class of spoiler. But I just want to grab each of the things that is defined as having a class of spoiler, and that's these. Three things. This paragraph, this paragraph, and this paragraph. We're then going to loop and we're going to do something to each of those things. So there's a number of different ways you could write the loop. This way is pretty simple. For S of list of spoilers, what that means is this loop is going to loop through for everything that's in that list of spoilers. And we're going to call the spoiler that we're looking at now S. So the first time through the loop, S is that first spoiler. The second time through the list, that S is the second spoiler. And the third time on the loop, uh, through the loop, S is that third spoiler. What are we going to do with it? Well, we want to call the show spoiler function, right? Because that's what we do. That's what we want to do when we show a spoiler. So we give the show spoiler function the ID of the of the of each of the spoilers on the list. So the first time through this executes, S points to this spoiler, this spoiler, and this spoiler. And we want to take the ID from that spoiler, send it to this function, because this function is expecting an ID of the spoiler that we want to show. And the effect is this loops through for each of the spoilers and shows each spoiler. Now, if you notice, I have console log s.id. I did this because, believe it or not, I'm not perfect. So when I wrote this code, I had some bugs in it. Uh, it didn't work the first time through. So I put some debug code in here to show me 
what got selected by S and what the ID was to make sure it's right. And I can see that when I click on show all spoilers, if I look at my council, that shows me that the first time through the loop, S is this paragraph and the ID is Spoiler one that's output from this line of code output from this line of code. Second time through the loop that is the spoiler that we're looking at and the ID is spoiler two and spoiler three. So don't hesitate to use the council log to display things. If especially when things don't work now, I probably should have commented this out. Once I got it working just to not print a bunch of error messages to the log. Now I talked about maintainability. What about this function would I have to change if I added a new spoiler? Absolutely nothing, because this is gonna grab all the things that have a class of spoiler. So as long as I define a new spoiler as having a class of spoiler, this list is gonna give it to me. And then this is gonna loop through however many spoilers there are in that list. So if I add a new spoiler, And I give it an ID of four, let's say. And we'll just put in a dummy one new spoiler. Here's the answer. Because this has a class of spoiler, it's going to get caught up in that list. And therefore, the loop will catch it and will display it. Show all spoilers. It now shows the fifth or the fourth spoiler as well. Now, um, what is the point of this exercise? Um, you, you know, you should always ask that for this example because, you know, the example isn't to show you how to show spoilers on a page, right? The, the, the example is for you to see some other technique. This is a technique you can use to get a list of things as opposed to one thing. We have get element by ID, which typically works if we're looking at just one thing. We can use get element by ID and give the ID that we're interested in and write code to do something with that ID. So that works just fine if we only have one thing that we want to do. Like when we click this hide spoiler button, we only want to hide this spoiler. So give it the ID of this spoiler and you're able to do that. When we click this button though, we want to get a list of things to do. And this shows you a good way to get a list of things to do. And it's all based on the CSS selector. So if I say dot spoiler, it would give me everything that has a class of spoiler. I could not that it would work, but I can do this in the statement and give me everything that has an ID of spoiler one. But if you know the ID, you might as well use get element by ID. And again, any CSS selector that we can put in here A would give me every link, B would give me every paragraph. All right, but in this case, we want to do everything based on a class, so we do dot class. People sometimes ask when, you know, when do you have an ID and when do you have a class? You have an ID so that you can refer to things individually. You have a class so you can refer to things as a group. All right. That's the takeaway from this. So if you ever have to 
go through a list of things instead of one thing, you can use this technique to get a list of them and then loop through them. All right, our next example is going to do two things. One thing it's going to do is it is going to show us how to interact with form data. We've seen one way that users interact with, with web pages by, by what typically would be called like gestures, like you put your mouse over a link or you put your mouse or you click a button or something like that. We're going to look at when the user enters data into a form and we want to do something with that data. How does it work? So this is sort of a dumb example. I won't say it's a dumb example. It's a, it's a simple example, but it teaches how to interact with some of the form controls that we have on a web page. It also shows us how to add HTML to an existing page. Remember, JavaScript can access and manipulate the CSS of a page, and it can access and manipulate the HTML of the page. Most of what we've done so far has been accessing and manipulating the CSS. We've made things display, and we've made things not display. We've changed the color of things. All right. Now, that's well and good, but we can actually add HTML content to the page if we want to. And this example shows this. So I double click on this. I have a case here where the gross pay depends on the hours that the employee has and whether they're a manager, an associate manager, or a manager trainee. So a manager that works 40 hours gets paid 600. And they have this really big check mark indicating that that valid data was entered. I'm going to go ahead and make this check mark smaller. That is if I know how to use Paint 3D. Let's see what else this has. Well, I know one way to fix it. We'll use CSS to fix it which isn't always the best method because the image is still that big. We just make our, we just make, make it smaller with CSS. So it's not necessarily the best way to do it in this course, but it's the, in this case, but this is the quickest. So I'll give it a width of a hundred pixels. I just don't want that to be comically large. <laughs> so I put in manager works 23 hours and they're a manager. Their gross pay is 345 and the data that I entered is valid. If I don't select a job type or if I put garbage in here, I get an X. I Specify that this is invalid. Check the spelling on that. And I give a list of the errors. A lot of people, when they do validation at first, they use alert boxes that, that pop up each error. Well, that's annoying if you have a large form and you get, you know, you, know, you make six errors and, and you get six alert boxes in a row. All right. It's also annoying if you write the code to only show the first error. So this is a nice way where we can look at every error and display it on the screen without uh, interrupting the flow. 
and showing all the errors. So this is the behavior that we're going to look at. If you pick a proper value, you get a check mark, valid, and you get the correct gross pay. If you don't enter in good data, you get an X, M of valid, <laughs> and a, a description of the error. So let's take a look at this. Now, this is a case where I have broken down stuff into several functions. And we'll look at each of these functions. I have a button here on button click. It says process form. There's not much in, in the terms of CSS on this page. I get rid of the dots in the in the unordered list. I made I just made the images small. Here's the HTML that I have. I do have a blank space where I'm going to put in the gross pay, a blank space to put the graphic in, and a blank space to put the errors in. I don't absolutely have to do that, but I kind of like to do it that way. That way I'm kind of prepared to know that there might be something in here. Plus from testing the CSS, I could hard code uh, error messages or whatever in there to make sure that it shows up right. So this is another case of me doing a little bit of this at a time and breaking down into functions. You don't want to try to do everything in one function. You could write this to do everything in one function. The problem is, is that function then becomes very, very long. Now, how long should a function be? A good rule of thumb is you should be able to see an entire function on the screen at one time. So I'm going to maximize this. I'm going to look at my functions. Process form. I can see everything at once. So that function isn't too big. Display image. I can see everything in that, all the code in there in one glance. Validate form. Well, this goes a little bit beyond my limit. I do have some extra blank spaces that I could get rid of. And it's close. Do keep in mind that I have my screen displaying the text bigger so that it's, it's more visible for you watching the video. So maybe if I was actually coding, there you go. It fits all on one screen. So that's the biggest of the functions. Calculate results fits on one screen, get type fits on one screen, get rate fits on one screen, and that's it. Why do I do something like get rate? Well, we'll talk about that when we get to it. So let's look at clicking on the button. When we click on the button, we call process form. What does process form do? It looks to see if the form is valid. So it calls a function called validate form. And does one of two things. If the form is valid, 
In other words, this is the equivalent of saying invalidate form is true. Validate form already returns a Boolean, so I don't need to say equals true part. If the form is valid, then I'm going to display the, the image indicating that the uh, data was entered correctly. I'm going to display the word valid. And I'm going to calculate the results. If the data is not valid, I'm going to display the image. Now, here's the thing. Let's say my job is to, uh, is to, um, if someone tells me the calculation isn't right, it's showing the wrong gross pay for these people. The nice thing is, is I can then focus on the calculate results function that does the calculation. I don't have to worry about the validate form function or any of that code because that code in this example is working properly. So I don't need to bother looking at that. I can really isolate the code that has a problem if it's broken down into functions as opposed to being just one large gigantic function. So let's look at what this display image function goes. It's pretty simple. I have two things. I have the name of the image I want to display and I have a little bit of text that says whether it's, you know, the, the, the alt text that I want to display. All right, so this is going to be some JavaScript we haven't seen before. We are going to create an image. We're going to create an image tag by saying bar image equals document dot create image or create element IMG. That creates, let me put comments in here. One thing that I, I suggest to students, if, if you're trying to study codes, trying to study the examples, is go through and put comments in and make sure that you understand what each statement is doing. Uh, that's a really good exercise, and if you are not sure about something, you can always ask. This is create an image tag. Now, where does that image go? Nowhere yet. I have, a, I have the code for an image tag floating in memory or outer space or however we want to view it. But I've created an image tag. I then am setting my attributes of that image tag. What are the two attributes that are typically used when we have an image? The source attribute and the alt attribute. So this creates a blank image. This line adds to that blank image whatever we pass as a file name. It could be valid or invalid. So this is the representation of the tag floating in space or memory. What does the next line do? It sets the alt attribute. So now we have a complete image tag. It doesn't appear anywhere on the screen yet though, because we haven't put it anywhere. We've just defined in memory an image tag called IMG and we've set the attributes of it. So that's what we have. We're now gonna decide where we're gonna put it. And the location where we wanna put it is Document get element by ID graphic. Now, 
I'm putting that location in a variable simply so I don't have to say document get element by ID graphic in every one of these statements. I can just say location. So I define my variable location as being the thing that has an ID of graphic. And that is down here. So this stores location of image destination at rhymes. What are we going to do now? We're going to get rid of what's already there. All right, why are we doing that? Because every time we click the button, we don't want a bunch of X's and check marks to accumulate in that area. So if we ran it one time, got any X, we run it a second time, we don't want another X appear in there. Or if we get a right answer, We don't want the check mark to appear along with the X. So we're going to clear out what we're everything in there. So what this does is as long as location has a child, we're going to remove that child. What do we mean by child in this case? We mean tags nested inside of it. All right. So in this case, for example, these two tags are considered to be children of that LI tag. And if we loop through and we move that next child would first get this one, then we'd get this one. And we're removing each of those. So we're, 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 we are removing everything that is in there before. And we'll see in a minute what is in there before. There is a text node with a message. Uh, and there is a, an image. So we get everything, get rid of everything already there. This is a code that actually adds the image to the destination. location. This creates some text and this adds the text to that destination also. So we create a message or, or a text node. That's another way to create a block of text that we're going to add. And then we add that there. Could I have created a paragraph tag here instead? Yeah, I could have. But I created text node just to demonstrate that particular. That particular instruction and I put that in the destination. So, in other words, regardless of whether the page is valid or not. When we're done here, we're going to have an image, a message, and maybe something else. Well, no, I stand corrected. That comes from Sora. That comes, we haven't seen where that comes from yet. We should probably change the spelling of invalid to invalid. So, we've covered this instruction. And that instruction allows us to add some HTML to the page. 
I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to going to go over validate form now, and we probably will get through it um, quickly today, but we may need to revisit it next time. So, what does validate form? I could have gone over these in any order, by the way. It, it just seemed like display image was low hanging fruit. It was a pretty simple, straightforward function. So I decided to go over that first. Validate form, what does that look like? Well, it's a function, accepts no arguments, and it's gonna return something. I put a B valid in front of it. It's gonna return a Boolean a Boolean is a variable that can either be true or false. So this function is going to set that variable to either true or false. True means that the form is valid. It means that there's no problems with the form. False means that there are some problems with the form. All right, and we're going to return that. We're going to return either the true or false, and the true or false will then show whether you calculate the result or display the error image. This, by the way, is a second way that we could create HTML on the page. This way, the way that I did in display image is probably a better way. But what I'm doing in validate form also works. I'm going to clear out the text in the error section. The error section is down here. Why do I do that? Again, for the same reason that I removed all the children in the previous function, because I don't want to continually add to the list every time I click submit. What is the inner HTML of get document get on by ID? It means everything that has been put between here and here. Now, there's nothing in here initially when the page loads, but when we run the JavaScript, we are going to be creating some HTML in that section. So we're simply wiping it clean, wiping a clean slate. We're going to assume that the page is valid. We're going to assume that the form is valid. Why do we do that? We do that because it's easier to code by assuming that the, the page is valid and then changing that flag to false if the page is not valid. Okay. In other words, in order for a form to be valid, everything on the form needs to be correct. In order for the form to be invalid, one thing on the form can be incorrect and the form, the whole form is invalid. So it's easier to code to look for one problem. And if that problem exists, boom, it's not valid. Uh, I then set hours to be the thing on the page that has a name of text hours and has this text box here. I trim hours. What does trim hours do? It gets rid of any spaces at the beginning and at the end. So if there's only spaces in here, trim hours is going to give me an empty string. So if I didn't put anything in there, if I put all spaces, then when I trim hours, it's going to be equal to an empty string. Well, if I didn't put anything for hours, flag goes up, the form is no longer valid, and I add an LI to my 
error message. I test to see if it's not a number. If it's not a number, then that's an error. So this test, if there's nothing in there, this test, if what I enter in there is not a number. It's not a number, I got an error. Finally, if I entered a negative number, well, the hours are correct, you know. At least someone can work is zero hours in a week. Someone can't work negative five hours in a week. So if either of these conditions and they're nested, so this is what we do if it's true. Otherwise, we do this block of statements. This is what we do if this one's true. Otherwise, we do this block of statements and so on. So when we leave this, one of two things is going to happen. Either B valid is still true if they entered in a proper numeric value, or B valid is gonna equal false, and we've added an explanation of the problem to the error message. We then call the get type function. And we're not gonna look at the function, but let, let's just trust to say that the, uh, Get type function, well, we'll look at it, looks at the thing called RB type and returns whether it is uh, whatever the value of RB type is. RB type is this drop down. That's a little deceiving. I had RB in the first version of this function. This was a uh, radio button. And that's this code reflects that. At any rate, we go and we look at and make sure that there's a value for there. If there's no value for there, then again, the form is invalid and we add to the error message. We find that we then add the and UL tag to the error message. And in error message, then we have a unordered list that may have no allies in it, if everything is okay, or it might have a couple of allies in it, if there's an error. If B valid is false, then we're going to go and add that UL to the inner HTML of this. So it's just like pasting that UL in this section of code and we're going to return the false, and that will keep the calculations from happening. Otherwise, we return true, and we go ahead and perform the calculations. Are there any questions at this point? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Zellers. So oh, you're, uh, if you could please type it in chat. Oh, okay, sure. Here, get the chat. Where is the chat? Um, I don't see the chat. Oh, there it is. Um, Why is create element better than inner HTML? Excellent question. Because create element actually puts stuff in the document tree, which allows us to traverse the document tree. And what that provides for us is greater flexibility. We can do more stuff. We can manipulate then the HTML that our JavaScript has created. So we could get in there and write other JavaScript if we wanted to, to manipulate the HTML that is created because it is then, it's then part of the tree, part of the document tree 
as opposed to being just a block of text that goes into uh, a tag. So it allows us for more flexibility. Internet shit will just change what's on the screen and not in the DOM. That is my understanding of it. Okay. Other questions? All right. Uh, please ask questions if you do have trouble, uh, either about the lab or what we went over today. Uh, next time we will finish this up and I think we will look at another example. So if there are no further questions, uh, we'll see you either in lab or see you next week.